Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for joining me this evening. Um, thanks for joining me today on Barbecue from Slavery to Freedomish. I wanted to give you my interpretation of why barbecue, particularly for black people, started in slavery and, and all the way to Freedomish. Um, through my research, as well as being a practitioner, I felt I did a lot of things to develop a lot of confidence in this particular uh, understanding of barbecue. Um, with being a practitioner of barbecue, uh, I felt like a lot of stuff was omitted in the literature. And so I want to kind of break that down and I, over the next five or so topics, I will examine all of this. So we're going to start here. My name is Howard Conyers, uh, originally from Manning, South Carolina, living in New Orleans, Louisiana. When I think about barbecue, I always ask the question when I was doing some of the early research is, why barbecue was found in Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and they had these earth dug pits holding the grounds, as some of the literature said, that look almost identical. And then you go to Alabama, Louisiana, as well as Texas, and this is particular, and you see these whole animal carcasses being butterflied open and laid over a pit. And so I started asking myself, how is that the case? Because back during that era, they didn't have YouTube, Zoom, Google, any kind of books on how to. So this, for me, the understanding this knowledge actually had to go through the heads and hands of the people who was being traveled across the American South. And so during that time, the people who was traveling and doing this actual work was in bondage. They were enslaved people versus slaves. Out of respect, I think we all must have the honest conversation and start use, stop using the word slaves and start referring to them as slave people because they were people. And these people built the foundation of the United States on their, back, on their backs and they gave it, uh, they gave it all through their blood, sweat, and tears for no pay. Uh, slavery throughout the diaspora was much different than what was practiced once Western world contact. And if you read this book called Barracoon and after going to Africa, it kind of talks about slavery and how it was practiced in Africa and how it was practiced in Africa short, in short, um, the people who were enslaved, they were more like indentured servants and could be part of the family members. But once they came to the United States or other places in the diaspora, South Africa, I mean, South America or the Caribbean, they were in bondage and there was no way of getting out until they could buy their way out. Um, when you think about the history of America, you have to think about who was in America before before slavery occurred in the indigenous community in particular. So North, the area known as North America was also known as Turtle Island. When enslaved Africans were brought to North America, the indigenous community was displaced. And why does, this is significant because also during the time of some early co-mingling and some things that each community, uh, they exchanged and some of those things still showed I'm not sure, I can't put a straight delineation into the barbecue culture uh, per se. Um, I can't find a direct correlation there. Barbecue culture, as we talked about previously in my discussion with uh, Joseph Haynes of Virginia Barbecue, it was something that was perfected, created and perfected in North America in the area starting with Virginia. Um, this is not the first time that Africans made contact, and I won't go into it deeply here, but King Massamusa made contact with North America a couple of centuries before the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so you can see that in some of the monuments. If you look in through like Mexico, you can see some of the monuments and you look at just look at the noses of some of those, some of the architects, some of the, some of the not architects, but some of the uh, architecture. And when you think about slavery in North America, it was actually uh, on a percentage basis, it was a lot smaller than what you would see in like Brazil. And the reason part of that is when you think about the major slave trading ports on the Western coast of Africa and its proximity to Brazil, it's really close. 
uh, the journey to say the Carolinas, Virginia, the Chesapeake uh, area was a lot further. So the rise and falls of slavery in North America, it'll start around, I don't necessarily like to say the 1619 date because some sources uh, say other dates a little bit earlier than that, but for the point of reference of clarity, we just, a lot of people use that date and we're just using it here for the sake of argument. But it's definitely, um, if you use that as a, if you try to draw a line in the sand, you could say slavery as well over 400 years old. And if you look at the timeline of how America grew before you were a colony, you have to understand this history because this history of slavery helps you understand how it uh, transpires, helps you to understand how the knowledge of barbecue actually went with the country. And because as the, as the colonies grew and expanded due to agricultural production from tobacco going into, uh, well, into going tobacco and then going to rice, cotton, and then in Louisiana, particularly sugarcane, that kind of helps you understand how this cultural knowledge of uh, our culture played a foundation for forming American history and created a lot of wealth. And it was easy to generate wealth when you're not paying anybody to do the physical labor. So here in 1776, you see some of the major slave ports of the U.S., um, made, mainly around the Virginia area, as well as the Carolinas. Uh, you see a large concentration. And if you look at like 1810, after the United States was fought for the independence from British, you can see how the concentration of enslaved people were in the New World, heavily concentrated around Virginia, heavily concentrated in the Carolinas. You, get, you see a small portion of people in the Kentucky area, and you see just a little bit in the Louisiana area, but during that time period, Louisiana wasn't necessarily part of the U.S. system. Well, I mean, I maybe made that, maybe made a mistake on that. Maybe should have we have to revisit that because it has something to do with the Haitian Revolution. I can't think of the year off the top of my head, but part of the Haitian Revolution has something to do with New Orleans former. We'll talk about that later. Um, these are some of the old cities in the southern colonies, and these are some of the earlier founding dates. I mentioned New Orleans up here just because it wasn't in the territory, but it's an older city in the country as we know it today. Jamestown was in Florida, and that was uh, actually colonized by the, by the Spanish in 1565, and that, that is technically the oldest city in the United States. Um, then you have like Jamestown, Colonial Williamsburg, then you have Charleston, and uh, just kind of give you a lay out, layout of what happened just briefly, but you can't really talk about the history of barbecue unless and how it transpired unless you really understand this. With the growth of the country, and, and I said initially, it started with tobacco in Virginia, and then it transpired and changed to rice. When they were cultivating rice, the enslaved Africans figured out how to cultivate rice in the New World because the geography and climate was very similar to Western coast of Africa. What made the enslaved people from Africa very valuable and the traders knew this, and they used this to their advantage to get a higher value of people, and they would go to certain regions in Africa to get people who already had a knowledge of cultivating rice to really um, grow their wealth. And this is why sometimes you hear people talk, serving Carolina gold rice, because it's just the amount of wealth that it generated for the colonies, and it, it really shifted how slavery changed in the new world um, because capitalism and greed helped change slavery into a form that it was unfamiliar to mankind. And so I would encourage anybody who want to just do a walk through understanding slavery and seeing it in real life and kind of seeing the change, make sure you go to the museum in DC when things open back up. But here's just some census maps of from the 1800s, uh, 1800s 
1840, and you see how the darker regions in 1800s, mainly around Virginia and Carolina, uh, and then as they expanded, it started going throughout the South. Uh, these maps where expansion of slavery came from this book, The Half Has Never Been Told. It's probably one of the most probably the most difficult books I have ever read on slavery because how it talked about the treatment of individuals, pure torture, um, how the whip, they said, was the most technological innovation. And when you read the book and it tells you about how the human body is able to do things that's not really possible to keep from being whipped. And for and let me just give you a clear example. Most people were really dominant, either left or right-handed. During slavery, and when they started using this whip on the uh, enslaved ancestors' back, the enslaved people, so a lot of enslaved people became ambidextrous so they could maximize their picking productivity levels so they wouldn't be whipped so severely by a whip. And so this book was probably the one of the most painful books I have read. It's a book that if you really want to understand American capitalism and the foundations of a lot of uh, banking system, Wall Street, uh, mortgages, uh, insurance policies, um, anything you could think of in trying to buy a house, it was actually applied to, it was applied and developed for the sale of human, of human people who at the time was in bondage and slavery. So I encourage anybody who wants to understand capitalism and how it's connected to our culture, you need to read this book, The Half Has Never Been Told by Edward Baptiste. As the country grew, it shifted the economies, the agricultural economy shifted from rice and they actually went over to cotton. Cotton, some people call it king cotton or cotton is king, that's a popular saying, but cotton is really what uh, drove the expansion of the United States as well as funneled, um, created a lot of wealth on a on the backs of enslaved people again. And we're growing an agricultural product, cotton, what one, what one's need, one needs to understand is when you grow cotton, it is very harsh on the soil. After so many years of planting on the, on the soil, if you don't properly fertilize and things of that such, your yields will go down. So um, you'll see, you will see in the literature that planters elite their children sometimes will leave from the East Coast, from Virginia, the Carolinas, and they will start traversing to like the Mississippi area, Arkansas area, into the deltas. And that is part of why I, you have to understand this history to better understand how barbecue travel with it, because as the country expanded and more cotton was needed for production, the people who was doing that work with the enslaved labor force who was being brought down from the Carolinas, um, being brought down from Virginia. And you could you see a lot of proof of that when you start thinking about uh, the Georgetown 272, um, being in Louisiana with that, that particular cell. But uh, you, that, that's one of the most, pop, most popular examples of one today. But you see the regions across the South where you see these dark shaded regions and a lot of these dark shaded regions are cotton growing areas like one of these regions in alabama is the black belt to alabama um the mississippi delta and so they was really heavily they were large producers of cotton this cotton and so this is just a typical bale of sale for nothing anything out of the unusual which you haven't seen before just a cotton and rice sale of Negroes, um, enslaved people, because they had a particular knowledge from growing sea island cotton and rice. And this was in Charleston, South Carolina. And I asked myself, I had to give you that little quick synopsis of how slavery uh, helped transform and how the country grew as a result of slavery, because without understanding how the country grew as a result of slavery, as well as the the agricultural products being transpired, you'll, you'll be hard for you to understand the barbecue tradition that goes with it because to me, 
in my research, barbecue up until a certain point in history really had to do a lot with farming and the agricultural practices. And that's the reason why the barbecue tradition stayed with black farmers in a lot of cases. Um, in the South, in particular in my community, a lot of a lot of people who are doing a barbecue were black farmers or they sharecropped. When I really went start digging deep and trying to understand barbecue, what made it resonate? I tried to start doing the research to understand after the result, like a Fox News story, and they were talking about, oh, no black pit masters. I really wanted to understand where that was coming from. And during that exercise, they was talking about, um, they didn't listen to African Americans, but a lot of rebuttals came out that said enslaved Africans made that particular, made the barbecue culture what it is. And also during that, around, just before that time period, I believe I did a lecture with Dillard University, the Ray Charles African American Material Culture Program. And so in preparing for those lectures, I start doing some homework and that's kind of what really kind of starts setting the tone for the research that I was doing. Um, that Fox News story where they left out African-American pit masters on the list of the inf most influential pit masters. I believe they should have been at least one or two on that particular list at that time. Um, one, one should have been on the list easily if you want to think about it in terms of whole hall barbecue as Rodney Scott, I thought should have been on that list at that particular time period, or Miss Helen Turner, for example. In doing the research, I, I start going across the something called the WPA and narratives. And in the narratives is the one you see up on your screen here. Um, it talked about how we used to kill hogs. And when I read it, it sound almost verbatim to how when I was growing up small in South Carolina, how my uncle, when we get ready to do a barbecue, we will actually slaughter a hog. And what was, what was interesting about this technique is this enslaved person, Annie Hulf out of Georgia, described the exact same process that we use. We will basically, before we barbecue a hog, we would get a hog from the farm or somebody we would get from one of our neighbors, we would bring them to a certain location. At that location, at that location, we would have water boiling in a wash pot or an old 55 gallon drum. Um, we would have this little station set up where we had a 55 gallon drum or old bathtub set up to help put the hot water in and a pallet at the end of that. So when we pull the hog out of the hot water, we could scrub the hair off with a knife and, and sometimes people a little bit, put a little bit of detergent because at a certain temperature, the hair would uh, come out the pores, and if the water is too hot, it would they would just turn. They call set. But um, the thing that really resonated in this particular passage for me is when they said they drove the hog to a certain spot and they struck the hog on his head with a hard blow. And I have seen, and I I can't do it today, but I have seen hogs in my youth being struck on the head. And the reason they struck him on the head and then they, they stabbed him with a knife is because the thought was they was going to kill that hog, but they also wanted to save that hog head for a particular use. And in my particular case, we used to save the hog head for hash. And if you had put a gun between the head of a hog when you killed it, you uh, you have to have a lot, pick out a lot of little shots. And so we it was a particular technique we used. Um, doing hog killers, but it was something that I was, uh, when I read this passage, it was kind of like, I really have a certain connection to the past that I didn't know because I never heard of these WPA narratives and what the WPA narratives are, are the Workers' Project Administration in the 1930s during the Depression, they was given writers jobs to help build the economy. And so during building the economy, they was interviewing adults who were formerly enslaved as children. The next confirmation for me when I start thinking about barbecue and slavery is I read narratives and in the narratives, they talk about how they used to cook them. And uh, this picture, while it's not from slavery, it looked almost identical with this man um, bent over, over a hog, over a pig actually, because the hog is a lot smaller, but We'd always call pigs hogs and hogs vice versa, but I learned later in life that hogs really have a certain weight delineation of 125 pounds to be exact or larger. But um, 
this man is cooking a hog in an earth dug pit uh, with some tree limbs. And when I when I got ready to give a lecture at Dillard University, my father made a picture of the sketch um, of the pit he used on the ground on the right. And it basically is a sketch of the pit that he learned how to barbecue in the ground for one hog. And if you look at it, the only thing different roughly from that pit, instead of using tree limbs as the main support systems to hold the animal, my father said they use metal pipes. And you got to think about it, as America grew, better building materials came available. But this is the picture of the sketch of my father in South Carolina. And what I will say about this is we can't take our culture for granted. And if we know a little bit of that culture, we have a responsibility to capture it so we can tell our own stories and so it's not lost indefinitely. Some of the greatest sources of our knowledge is going in the cemetery, our culture, and we need to make sure we present that, prevent that from happening. So older family members, if you think you have some family stories, you might want to document them. Uh, we have stories you might want to share with me, contact me. We might set up some kind of wall recording session for you. Um, but I believe these stories all throughout the South, particularly black people, they need to be recorded again because the sharecroppers is pretty much the last link to slavery in the American South. And because um, sharecropping is really nothing but slavery, if you think about it, you couldn't really get ahead with it. And it was just another form of it. Barbecue occasions during slavery, particular holidays where we had barbecue. Uh, political rallies, and the reason I said a celebration for who and whom, um, not everybody, depending on what side of the table you was on, you didn't get to enjoy the barbecue in different, in the same manner or different ways. So certain celebrations that limbs for a barbecue during the antebellum period with political rallies, holidays like the 4th of July, Christmas, weddings, harvest celebrations, frolics. Um, and then other occasions where they had this, what I'm gonna call steal away to the woods. Enslaved Africans used to steal hogs from the plantation owners and they used to barbecue them in the woods. And I think that's really shows a sign of resistance, passive resistance. And actually they paid for those hogs throughout their labor. So um, while maybe it was stealing, they deserved those hogs just as much as anybody else. They paid for them with their work who made, who made the people rich. But that's also, in some ways, I believe how they perfected the craft of barbecue and got it better because if you mess up a plantation barbecue, it would be a big problem for you. Um, but if you want to learn more about the earliest days of barbecue between 1620, I would encourage you to read one of my friend's books, um, really getting to know him well. And I'm still trying to learn more about him, but the work he's doing in barbecue is really fascinating. His name is Joseph Haynes. He wrote a book called Virginia Barbecue. It's probably the most comprehensive book on, on barbecue that I know. And when I talk about bar barbecue, I'm talking about whole animal cooking, uh, pit cook, butterfly, animal open. Um, and so when I thought about barbecue, to see a former enslaved person describe barbecue the same way uh, from 1897, Lewis, Hay Lewis Hughes, he gave a definition of from a 4th of July, and it, he said it was a whole hog, but it could have been a whole cow, a whole goat, a whole sheep, a whole lamb, a whole turkey, a whole, um, whole chicken. It also could have been possum, could have been coon. Uh, it just all depends, but during slavery, people ate what they had to do to survive. and. Um, Sometimes you, if you are hungry, you'll eat a possum. And some people eat, still eat coon and possum on occasions. I guess they say a good possum go good with sweet potatoes. Somebody had to tell me that because I'm, that's one animal I'm not going to cook or eat. So, uh, well, I might cook it one day, but I'm not, probably not going to eat it. Uh, but uh, you never know. If things get hard enough, you'll do any, you'll eat it. So this is uh, Lewis. Hey, Hughes, uh, account of what a barbecue is. And if you want to find more about but this particular barbecue description, I wrote a blog post on it. It's on my website at howardconyers.com. It's from March 2018. Illustrations of early barbecues. 
when they had early barbecues, there were no photographs to be taken. So the only thing you really had to go on was the artistic renderings and artist expressions. And so what you see here is a political barbecue. You see the slave person toiling over the barbecue pit in the foreground of the picture. In the background of the picture, you see clearly see two individuals to the top right. And um, those are probably the planters or somebody who's trying to get um, the planter elite, trying to get votes of some sort or campaign. In the background, you see a lot of spectators and they look like they're in a wooded area. So this is just an early illustration of a barbecue. And um, that's the only thing we really have. And you don't really have a lot of stuff on from the enslaved point of view. And so that's the, part of the reason I want to share my perspective, because when I read, when I read some of those enslaved narratives, a lot of those practices of how we cook barbecue was passed down orally. And so, or we actually did, or actually was a part of participating in events where we actually did that. And not necessarily no culinary events. These were events down on the farm back in South Carolina growing up. And you just did certain things. Uh, it was just a way of life. I didn't think anything special until I actually left home and moved to New Orleans. So in this whole barbecue journey, it's very interesting because the enslaved, our enslaved ancestors left receipts of their evidence of what they did on this craft. Um, an example of this receipt was left at James Madison Montpelier Plantation. James Madison, one of the early presidents of the United States. And at one of the, on one of the archaeological digs, they found that a, a barbecue pit. It was uh, filled in between 1800 and 1850, so uh, it was probably in use between the uh, it was in use in the 1700s for sure. And if you see the images to the right, it was made by UVA. They actually did a 3D scanning of it and did a did a rendering of it. And if you look at it when they put those tree limbs across, it almost looked like some of the earlier sketches where my uh, where my father drew his sketch years ago. Other presidents, including besides James Madison, who was known for doing barbecues, would be some like George Washington. Uh, they, and we know during those time periods, the people who was doing that labor were enslaved Africans, as they did all the physical and hard work. I just want to give Joseph Haynes a special shout out for giving me a lead on this particular um, barbecue pit. He, we had a, in a conversation, he was talking about, uh, they found the ropes and pit in the ground, and I was talking about how when you cook in the ground, especially clay soils like this, when you, after the first cook, that the walls get really hard, almost like a brick. And um, he was just saying, when, he, when I brought that up, he said, oh, they found something like that in Montpelier. And so I reached out to the folks at Montpelier and they gave me this information. And so I wanted to share it with you. And I will probably share an upcoming blog post on about a little more details about that particular excavation um, and interpretation of it as well. So ideal location for barbecues, there was usually a grove under a shade of trees. They were near, generally lived near a stream of water and the water was used for a variety of things. They were used for soups, stews, punch, mint juleps and toddies. Um, the water kept the root cool, kept the drinks cool, and also it could have been used to keep the meat cool. And so if you see the figure to the right, you see the actual imagery of the uh, of a barbecue in the woods under a shaded grove. You see who's doing the work. And what you're seeing, a lot of these guys are doing, they look like they're mopping the animals. They're not putting coals in their pit, but they're mopping the animals with a barbecue sauce. Uh, we'll talk about a, the mop sauce in a few minutes coming up soon. I mentioned earlier something about stealing hogs. And so that was a real thing, just so you know. So they, when they stole hogs to barbecue, they served some time with hash and rice. And this is a narrative from uh, Estella Jones in Georgia, and she gave this description. The men have even stole hogs from other people and barbecued them. Then they will cook hash and rice and serve barbecue. The overseer knowed all about it, but he ate as much as everybody else, and it kept his mouth shut. He was real good to all the slaves. He never run you. I didn't copy everything from that particular narrative, but 
I just want to kind of point out to you like how hash and rice and barbecue uh, really go hand in hand. Um, it was a very popular siding, South Carolina. I wrote a blog post on it because I wanted to give a real depth, in-depth perspective of what hash is and what it is not, particularly to the black community, because I have seen a lot of definition of what hash is in regards to barbecue and what's serving the barbecue restaurants. Nothing against a barbecue restaurant. I know they can't do everything they do back at home, do it in a home environment, but we do need to make sure we capture and document what hash and rice truly is. And I think when I saw a lot of the descriptions of hash and rice, I never saw the descriptions of hash and rice as I totally experienced, especially when I talked about not just liver and likes, but when I talked about a chopped hash as well as a grounded hash and whether one had barbecue sauce or one without barbecue sauce, essentially. Uh, a modern day barbecue sauce, not necessarily modern for his, um, one of the name brands, but a, a barbecue sauce that maybe have a mixture of mu mustard, tomato, uh, vinegar, and other ingredients. During the plantation era, one of the barbecue sauces that was the oldest barbecue sauce in America, and if you look at uh, the show Nourish, he did an episode with uh, Rodney Scott, and we had a vinegar pepper-based barbecue sauce, but he has a vinegar pepper-based barbecue sauce, and that barbecue sauce, to me, is representative of the oldest barbecue sauce in the country. Um, but if you look at the very basic ingredients, a lot of these ingredients are found today in barbecue sauces. Vinegar, red pepper, salt, oil, oil or butter, sugar, or molasses, and I said just a touch. Um, the reason I said just a touch is during that time, people, sometimes people like to cut vinegar with a little bit of sugar because you got an acid base reaction going on that cut that twang, as some people like to say, uh, with a little bit of sugar. And so these are the basic, basic building blocks of a very simple barbecue sauce that's very uh, timely, really one of the oldest, really the oldest barbecue sauce in America. If you, you see elements of this in the Caribbean as well. You see elements of a vinegar pepper based sauce in Africa. And all of these things, if you think about it, could have been made on a plantation. Vinegar could be made from wine, wine fermentation that went bad. Red pepper can be grown. Salt was probably one of those valuable things that they had. Um, oil or butter was made. Butter, oil or butter was made. And sugar or molasses were made. So very, Probably on every plantation, everybody grew a patch of cane. And during the sharecropping days, a lot of farmers had always had a patch of cane. So even if they wasn't in Louisiana, farmers in South Carolina and Georgia, Mississippi, they always had a patch of cane, and they did that so they could make sure the cane served. Um, this this slide is probably a little bit out of place, but I think it's important for you all to understand barbecue woods. And the three main barbecue woods that people would generally cook that in the South was oak, hickory, and pecan. Oak and hickory were the two dominant sources, but what really made oak and hickory dominant is also based upon geography. These are two hardwood trees, and if people who like drinking bourbon, oak is the bar oak is generally the wood used to make well. Joke, oak is the barrel. Oak is the wood used to make the barrels. But I believe in my, I can't, find, I can't verify this particular fact, but I believe one thing the enslaved Africans did get from the indigenous community is understanding what cooking woods were better for making fires for cooking purposes. And so I believe this is definitely one contribution you could easily give to the indigenous for, um, for barbecue. I can't say the actual process of digging a pit, um, and put, cutting the whole animal butterfly open, but I could definitely say the woods for sure. And if somebody finds some information, some clear, concise, pinpoint information on what indigenous community added to the barbecue culture, I would love to see it. Um, and I want more than just the hurdles or boucan that's over a live fire cooking. I never really shared my theory on why that was the case, um, but I can tell you from experience as a practitioner, if you cook in a hog and 10 hogs over a live fire, it'll be kind of hard to manage that heat over time, manage that heat, especially as the heat drops. So there was, you had to evolve the process to use embers, which you can have more control of controlling the heat. 
Um, I may write about that one day, just why I can't see cooking over a boot can as the foundation of American barbecue. With barbecue sauce, so I skipped one, but I want to go back. And this is a more detailed instructions from Wesley Jones. It was in the South Carolina Narratives, and it basically described what his barbecue sauce consisted of. It consisted of vinegar, black and red pepper, salt, butter, a little sage, coriander, basil, onion, and garlic. And he said some folks drop a little sugar in it. So I, so what I was telling you about a little bit of sugar, that little bit of sugar cuts the twang on the vinegar. And anybody who cook collards, sometimes you know people put a little vinegar, but they also put a little sugar. It just all depends on who taught you and where they come from, but their school of thought is. But uh, it describes, this particular passage clearly describes his barbecue sauce and why he will mop the sauce. And so in certain, certain things I have done and exploring my journey, like I used a mop and I made a recipe for cooking because a mop recipe, particular events, not because my family and community barbecue sauce had that, but I wanted to be historically accurate in that representation so people can understand that this stuff is not really just made up. But what I will say about the mop, when I made one mop for an event with, uh, did an event with BJ Dennis in Charleston, South Carolina, we we made a mop from an old tree limb, and then we used a new cotton material, and I made it pretty instructions. My father told me in a conversation, and so I wanted to kind of bring a real mop to the actual, show you what a mop was. It wasn't necessarily a mop you used a mop the floor that some people use today, but I wanted to show how the mop can be made basically from a swap of cotton rag. As good as a vinegar pepper-based barbecue sauce is, it also has an equivalent negative side. The barbecue sauce from actually was used as a as an antiseptic. Sad to say, I, it kind of hurt me when I read this book. On, I read a book on maroons, and I saw this particular description of what was inside the what was inside of the solution they poured on our enslaved ancestors' back. But it had salt, red pepper, vinegar. Um, and they call it an antiseptic, but they also call it a pickling process. And it was just chilling to read the, the description of this. But I thought it was important to share because vinegar pepper-based barbecue sauce could be good, but it also has a negative connotation too, a very painful connotation. And so um, any time in barbecue and slavery, I thought it was important to mention here. Finally, this is one of the last uh, descriptions of a barbecue that came from another enslaved person, but it's various in descriptions just like this all throughout the WP narratives from different states, uh, different books. But this particular description said what animals were cooked, and um, it said whole goats, whole land, whole hogs, sheep, and a side of cow. And um, when I when I read narratives like this as well as others. I, I was very familiar with cooking hogs. Uh, we cook a goat once or twice. Sheep we never cook, or lamb, which is a younger sheep, and a side of cow. I never heard of that. And a uh, side of cow could also be referred to in the literature as an ox or a steer. So I knew to become a, a pit master, I really have a really good understanding of American barbecue history. I knew I had to go back through this journey and cook every animal, domesticated animal, animal that I saw in the literature. And so that's the reason I went back ultimately to cook the lamb, the, the goat more, and then finally I finished that up with the cow, which I would say through my journey was very significant, not just for me, but it also understanding the time this whole barbecue culture together. How did barbecue knowledge travel? Since we didn't have Google and things of that such, you have to realize the information that barbecue travel in the heads and hands of people. You didn't have the Food Network, you didn't have Instagram, you didn't have the cooking channel, you didn't have PBS or YouTube. So you had to really understand the domestic slave trade. And the domestic slave trade was starting in 1808 because they outlawed international transatlantic slave trade. And so when that came went into effect, people from Virginia and the Carolinas uh, would ship generally to the Louisiana area. Um, 
but they also shipped to Mississippi. But the reason I say the Louisiana area, because New Orleans particularly was that coastal slave port where you could exchange, where human cargo could be traded and that was at the foot of the Mississippi River. And so they could be shipped up the Mississippi River to Natchez and Vicksburg. And those are actually large slave ports, dom domestic slave ports, and that helped help people get up people to the deltas, the Mississippi Delta, the Arkansas Delta. And so if you look at this map closely, you can kind of see the various paths of people. So it's not uncommon in people with family lineages, lineages that you'll see people from Charleston, um, with Charleston roots in New Orleans. You'll see people from the Virginia roots in the New Orleans. But it's, it's because of this particular situation where uh, the transatlantic slave trade was initially outlawed. But don't think because they outlawed slaves weren't being smuggled into the United States. Uh, also, before this particular thing is New Orleans was very pivotal, and the reason New Orleans came was so pivotal and how it came part of the United States is because of the Haitian Revolution. And so that was one of the major reasons when I did an event, Gumbo Jubilee, that I knew that you had to have the contribution of Haitian, the Haitian cuisine on New Orleans because um, it's significant. And New Orleans wouldn't have been able to be purchased by the U.S. government without the Haitian Revolution. They don't like to talk about it in history, but if you read the books, it was, it's pretty, it's well documented that New Orleans was sold as a result of the Haitian Revolution. And so and it was because the Haitian, Haiti was a French territory and New Orleans at that time period was a French territory, even though in different iterations, it, it's, it flip flops between Spanish and French territories. I went back to show this map, and I can't, we talked about this earlier, but like this map is the 1860 census, and it shows you where the, if you look at the shaded regions, you see where African American, where enslaved Africans at the time were heavily dispersed throughout the South. And if you look at it, you see them in the Carolinas, you see them in the Georgia, you see them in Alabama, you see them in Mississippi, you see them in Eastern Texas. And they, every, all of these places, you found barbecue pits that was built almost the same type of structure. There was a hole in the ground with tree limbs that overlaid the pit and a whole animal that was butterflied. And so that to me confirmed how barbecue transpired with slavery. When you look at those pictures um, that I showed you earlier, and you look at the, you think about this map. It clearly delineates, it clearly indicates that barbecue went with slavery across the American South. Uh, you look at, and the pictures wasn't from the 1800s, but being in the mid 19th, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, there was nothing really changing too much. So if you look at these pictures again, and I brought them back up so you could look at them and really put it in perspective. The pits in North Carolina, the pits in Virginia, the pits in Florida, the pits in Georgia, they look almost identical because that information of how to cook barbecue went in the heads and hearts of enslaved people. At this time, when they showing these pictures, these are the descendants of enslaved people. They were the sharecroppers, but they were still the people who were doing the work. Um, and you look at Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, you see these pits and people say Louisiana didn't have a barbecue culture. And I, I wanted to show you this picture in Louisiana in the bottom right corner, because it's just so you can understand the perspective of Louisiana had these pits. They had a barbecue culture. I can't wait to uncover more, more pictures and imagery of people cooking in the hole in the ground. I hope I could find some pictures in Mississippi. It actually, there is a, I seen some pits in the ground in Mississippi. There was this uh, famous cane player named Otto Turner, I believe his name. And he's, he played the cane, which is almost like a flute, but it was made from a piece of cane, but he had this annual barbecue. And in one of the videos, he had a pit in the ground and it basically was like a rack above it. And so I knew Mississippi has this culture too, but if anybody from Mississippi, any of these Southern states, if you have images, please send me an email. I would love to incorporate them in some of my future work uh, because I think what I want to do, or not what I think, but I want to make sure that I account accurately for all the Southern states and understanding the barbecue culture. Um, 
and I want to give you what it really means because I, I took the time to understand from slavery to probably the mid 19, 1970-ish time frame because that's when my father last started cooking in the ground. And I will talk about my own journey in barbecue, but I really don't do this work for me. I do it for the people who came before me. I want them to get the credit for it. It's nice that you all know Howard Conyers, but I really want you all to know the people who really cultivated this stuff because a lot of these people in these pictures don't have any names. And I want you all to know they created something significant. As slavery ended, um, you have a, you have different events where you start forming these black towns. Um, but before you start forming the black towns, you had an event in Texas called, uh, you probably heard of Juneteenth. And in Juneteenth, a lot of the Juneteenth holidays, this is where they, they announced where Emancipation Proclamation. This is probably a, a holiday, this is a holiday that I believe African Americans should celebrate more. Um, it was a holiday that I never really heard growing up. Um, I heard it in my later years, in my adult years, but I never heard it going in my younger years. But in a lot of the descriptions, they always talk about pits being dug. And it let me know that they were using these same earth dug pits as y'all saw in those previous pictures. Um, construction style, similar. Some of the barbecue sauces, probably similar. The only thing maybe different in some of the later barbecue sauces is condiments such as ketchup and mustard start coming on the market or whiskey sauce or other things like that hot sauces, those things actually made it into the barbecue pot, made it into the barbecue sauce pot. When you think about history after slavery, reconstruction was a time, after slavery, a lot of slaves, enslaved people didn't have any place to go. So they start going to these, form, start leaving the South and going to black towns. They, some were in the South, but some was outside of the South. And these black towns was a refuge for racial violence as well as a place to gain financial independence. But in a lot of, in a few cases, there's, it's well documented, and I believe Adrian Miller going to do a, I know he's going to do a great job in explaining two cases, I believe. I don't know. I haven't read his book, his forthcoming book that's coming out in 2021. But I know he, I'm pretty sure he's going to cover uh, Columbus Hill and the event he did in outside of college, in, outside of Denver in regards to barbecue as well as Nicodemus, Kansas. Kansas. So uh, I'm not going to say much about that, but I encourage any of you who listen to really look at the black towns and look at how they uh, thrive economically and also look at the destruction. And it, it, may, it may give you some insight of how America um, look at, treat black people when they become successful in the past, and it may not be that much difference today, but I just encourage you to look at the black towns after the Civil War, and there's a lot of black towns. These are, these are just a small subset and very fascinating history, like Miles Bayou, and you look at the people who created that particular town, very fascinating story in Mississippi. Barbecue animals. So during slavery, you had these different animals, the only animals that majorly was different, um, they would probably still cook. While I didn't list turkey, possums, I didn't list rabbit, possums, and coons post slavery. I'm pretty sure they were still eating those animals. I don't think believe they would barbecue them as much. The main animal that I think between slavery and post slavery that they barbecued was the cow. Um, and the reason I believe the cow wasn't barbecued after slavery because you had to have a, a significant amount of wealth to be able to own a cow, or own multiple cows to barbecue. Plus you have to have the number of people that it takes to, if you kill an animal and people, when they was killing animals back then, they were not gonna have any waste. And so they were using everything from that animal. And so they wasn't killing the whole cow to feed 50 people or 60 people. Also, because I, when I went to go, my journey of cooking a cow, I, I went to talk to my father about like, did, they ever, did he know anybody ever barbecue a cow? And they kind of, first he kind of thought I was crazy, but I said, no, the literature said they barbecue cows in the same way they barbecue pigs. And I wanted to validate that. And he said, no, we didn't have a cow. We, we had cows, but the cow's purpose was generally for primarily for milking cows and so, and making butter and things of that sort. Things of that sort. So, um, and when they got rid of the cow, they went and got another. They got another one uh, as the cow got older. So the barbecue thing with the cows is uh, 
that was one of the things I thought that was lost in history. Um, I actually talked to a young man who said his that drove at night from out of Virginia. He said his father cooked the cow in early 2000, but he said it wasn't anything significant in history. He just said the slot actually, it just actually had the cow. So uh, I'm not sure how many African Americans have cooked cows in the past hundred years. Um, it's, it hasn't been many people. It takes a special skill set, uh, takes special equipment because I believe you should. Because if you could do a process better, you should improve on it. And so there's two videos out that uh, shows how when I went to cook the cow in 2018, how we attacked the, the father and myself with designing and building a new barbecue pit to attack how to cook a whole cow. And um, it's out there on the web. One is on with Nourish, done with PBS, and another one is done by Paul Grant with Accenture, with Ascension. Uh, studios, if you type if you type in the Gumbo Jubilee, you will see that particular video um, of how to cook a whole cow. And I think it's pretty fascinating. I, and more and more I think about it, it was a very special moment. And for all the people who was there at Gumbo Jubilee who witnessed and partake, I really appreciate, appreciate you all coming. Um, but cooking a whole cow was very significant to me on my barbecue journey as well as I wanted, I did it to also help solidify the roles that African Americans contributed to American barbecue and also be able to fill in any gaps in the literature or understanding the cooking process of a whole cow. Because the only way you could truly fully understand the cooking process is you actually do it. And to be able to go from start to finish, while well, I didn't kill a cow itself, but building a pit and think about all the different things that I would have to consider really helped me become a better um, cook. Barbecue. Barbecue as well is, is one of the most segregated things. And if you look at this barbecue right here, it was very segregated. This was after slavery, of course. This is due to Jim Crow air. Um, but you see it's very segregated. Look at the lines of people. Part of the barbecue culture and why it survived and why it was maintained, I think these are some things that represent in black culture that I think we really have to really see where barbecue traditions were preserved. It definitely was preserved in black farming communities. This family, this, this is a picture of a family going to pick cotton, I mean, going to chop cotton. Um, you have the church. Generally when churches had homecomings, they, somebody barbecue a hog, uh, they had picnics, uh, church picnics, and so you, sometimes you have uh, people barbecue hogs. My father used to barbecue hogs on occasion for our own church in the community. And then the top right, you see this uh, moonshine still. And uh, moonshine and barbecue went together from probably ever since they were practicing cooking barbecue on the plantation. Enslaved people was cooking the barbecue as well as they were running into the distilleries. Uh, they don't talk about that a lot, but we all know who was doing this work during that time frame. It was more than just the near screens of the world who was making liquor. Um, it's well documented that George Washington, President George Washington had six enslaved Africans who ran his distilleries. And if you look at all the major distilleries in the, uh, in like the Kentucky region, most of those uh, Confederate generals and people politicians, a lot of presidents, and anybody who had any means of wealth or money, they had enslaved people. So, but that's here nor there. But uh, these are the four things that I think really contribute a lot to preserving barbecue culture. And so, when you think about this craft barbecue culture movement, um, craft barbecue or whatever you want to call it, barbecue and craft, but the people who built it was black people. Um, and also the same people building the moon, making the moonshine. And we sh one thing we need to think about, and enslaved people had certain knowledge when they came here. Yes, Europeans were making liquor in England and stuff like that. But when I went to Ghana, they was doing fermentation in Ghana. You see fermentation in pyramids, but I also saw distillation while on my trip to Ghana this past year. So um, this past December. And so uh, I know firsthand, they, they may not wasn't fermenting corn, but they were definitely fermenting, fermenting palm wine and distilling it. And I saw the stills that they used to actually make, call, I don't know if they call it stills in uh, Ghana, 
but I seen it with my own eyes. Barbecue in the South, um, in the cities, it looked a little different than maybe in the in the fields. And this was in the 1950s. Uh, this was a barbecue pit in a restaurant in New Orleans, uh, right off Claiborne Avenue. This is an example of a barbecue pit. Um, and it was above ground, that's not a below ground. And so when you move, start moving to the cities, people start cooking above ground. Well, I didn't talk much about the Great Migration. I wanted to kind of give you an ending point of this particular talk is the Great Migration, when you start looking at the South and you start seeing where people go, they start taking their barbecue traditions with them. It may not have been cooking whole animals and and I'm going to say this loosely, uh, they took their barbecue traditions, when they took it, I would say there was, they were barbecue traditions, but it was also more like grilling than barbecue, because barbecue is a very um, slow process, and grilling is pretty quick and intense, high heat. Um, but these are some of the places where people left when they left the South, and they left for a variety of reasons. But uh, we'll talk about it more next time. And why why people left the South? Yes, racism was bad and why people left the South, but technology caused a lot of people to leave the South. And when you think about technology, one of the greatest technological innovations that got black people off land in the South is the invention of the cotton picker. And the cotton picker did more for people, the free people from the land than the actual emancipation proclamation. And the reason the cotton picker made it easier because the cotton picker was basically re replacing human labor. And so as they replaced human labor to the, the gain more profit in, capital, in a capitalistic world, that's always the name of the game, main, make more profit. And so you create technology. So it's almost like a form of automation. So when you think about automation and technology improvements, like today when we sit in, you got AI and all these different uh, technology for automation and robots and stuff. It's just another way to disrupt labor systems. And, and at some point, if you don't prepare accordingly, I'm biased, I should say people should study the STEM fields because you need to understand science, technology, engineering, mathematics to be able to develop these type solutions um, to solve problems. And, you, and there will always be problems to solve. And so that's kind of why I look at things a little bit different and study and understand barbecue. But I want to show like one piece of equipment. It really got a lot of people off the land. And this was the cotton picker was built in, and I think it was, it was, it started being working, started being work on in like the 1920s uh, by John Daniel Russ. And probably by the 1940s, he had a, there was a pretty good working representation of a cotton picker. And that right there, along with racism, got people out of the South faster um, than anything else. And as my final slide on barbecue and slavery, uh, from slavery to freedom-ish, I think it's important to think about this particular man, James Pitmaster James Jones in the Mariana Delta, it kind of solidified to me how barbecue moved with slavery because when I drove up to Mariana, Arkansas, and just sit, drove up to the barbecue restaurant and I smell outside, I thought I was in a barbecue in South Carolina or Eastern North Carolina. It smelled like at the house. Um, and this is even before I walk into the building. But in countless stories that I read on Jones Barbecue Diner, it talked about him cooking in a hole in the ground, but they never really gave any any kind of question on what is the hole in the ground. And so when I was there, I was able to have a conversation with him, and he said exactly what he confirmed to me what I thought occurred in the hole in the ground and what was cooked in the hole in the ground, and he told me exactly. So they were cooking whole hogs and goats in pits on the ground, just like in the American South. Um, the barbecue sauce was very similar to what you would see in Eastern North Carolina, as well as the PD region of South Carolina where I'm from. And so that was just like anecdotal evidence that slavery really shared the knowledge of barbecue across the American South. And I, and I put this particular family up because 
this particular man, uh, because his family had this barbecue down in Mariana since 1910, but with counting the generations and the conversations he gave with me and trying to put an age and how far back, this particular man, I think his family is the only family that I know that in a clear lineage that had a barbecue restaurant that could go clear black into clear back into slavery. Um, there's a lot of other people, there's a few other people I have been made aware of who cook barbecue, but this is the only one that I have met um, through one lineage, um, and maybe a few other people, but this man's story here is a story that um, really should confirm to me how barbecue is the same across the American South, and it went with slavery. In future talks, I'm planning to talk about barbecue through the Great Migration, probably going to look more specifically at Chicago barbecue as an example. Um, black women in barbecue, barbecue hash, styles from liver pudding, and evolution of barbecue pit cooking. So these are the things I will talk about over the next couple of weeks. Uh, just wanted to kind of share a little bit of my knowledge on barbecue from my perspective. And if you have any questions, you want to get in contact with me, you have any or th things you want to share with me, please shoot me an email. Uh, my, my email is on my website and I would love to hear from you or you hit me up on Instagram or Twitter. And um, thanks again. And I hope you learned something from this talk. Um, I hope you learned something about barbecue and slavery. This is just through my research, combination of my research, combination of my being on the receiving side of oral history as well as being a practitioner i want to present you all the stuff that i have, some of the stuff that i have researched um through my readings in a concise way to share the story of barbecue and slavery so i think that's it um keep keep me posted and at this time uh, we will um i see you in the next couple of weeks. So just so you know, oh, this pit here behind me is uh, from Eastern North Carolina from Mr. Jack Cobb and son. I, I like this pit and I, I showed it to you because I wanted to, uh, this pit was special because I looked at it. When I saw this pit, it kind of reminded me of the pits that was in the ground. These pits were above ground and literally these pits could have literally been placed in the ground and so I thought it was significant to show these particular pits in this exercise or this talk so thanks for your time have a nice day I hope you enjoyed it if you have any comments please leave below